Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore archaeological discoveries related to the Bible. I'm Henry Smith. Today, Brian Wendell joins us to talk about King Jehu, ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel in the 9th century B.C. Hi, Brian. Welcome back. Good to see you again. Thanks so much, Henry. It's always great to join right. you. Thanks for having well, me. It's great to have you. You know, as you, as you know, you are the record holder. I think we're in the 30s <laughs> here with how many times you've been on the show. It's uh, You're going to catch me and Scott pretty soon. Oh, uh, well, you just keep asking and I can't say no. So <laughs> thanks. It's an honor. Well, I think our audience can't say no either. All right. Well, let, let's get right to it. We're going to be talking about uh, a king here that uh, maybe some people haven't heard of uh, Jehu of the Northern Kingdom, 9th century BC. Why don't you give an introduction on that? Sure. Well, uh, Jehu's story is told in the book of 2 Kings um, 9 and 10. And uh, there we learn that Jehu for years had served as a commander in the uh, armies of uh, King Ahab. And he uh, was probably most famous uh, for his ferocious uh, chariot driving. That's what uh, we're told in 2 Kings 9.20. And one day while he was in a council of war, a prophet showed up and uh, called him into the back and anointed him as king over Israel and then gave him this command, this message from the Lord. We're told that the Lord sent him this message, said to Jehu, you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. And in the bloody coup that followed, uh, Jehu killed uh, Ahab, he, king of uh, Israel. He killed um, Ahaziah. Uh, sorry, he killed Joram, king of Israel. Ahaziah, king of Judah. Jezebel, the queen mother. He uh, killed all of the people who had remained loyal um, to, uh, to Ahab's house. And then he deceitfully called this gigantic, solemn, um, the solemn time to worship Baal, and uh, really with the intent of killing all of the Baal worshipers and the priests and the prophets. And so he wiped out uh, Baal worship, and he wiped out the house of Ahab um, and in response to the Lord's command. And then he reigned for about 28 years as king over Israel from about uh, 841 to 814 B.C., it's a significant period of time. I mean, sometimes we see kings rule quite shortly, so 28 years is a long time. Of course, from the northern kingdom, which, uh, you know, just produced one wicked king out of the other, uh, his, his legacy seems to be somewhat of a mixed one. He got rid of his Baal worship, but uh, we have more to talk about with that. Now, in terms of, in terms of uh, where he ruled from, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, the capital was Samaria. Let's talk about that. Do we have any archaeology related to that? Yes, well, Samaria has been excavated. And um, so just a little history of it. Um, when Omri became king of Israel, he moved the, the capital of Israel from Terza to Samaria. He uh, bought this hill from Shemer and he constructed a palace there. And um, it was excavated in the early 1900s by the Harvard ex uh, ex expedition and the original structure um, was uh, excavated there. They found out that it had been built in the time of Omri, but then it had been uh, expanded later, and they attributed that to Ahab, to Ahab, Omri's son. But uh, more recent scholarship has suggested that it might actually come from the time of Jehu. That Jehu might have been the one who did the additions there, and that would make sense. Jehu reigned for almost three decades. Probably wanted to put his own stamp on Samaria. Well, while he was there. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot remains there because um, Herod the Great built a temple to Caesar Augustus, and he pretty much obliterated most of what was there from the Israelite period. So has been excavated, but there's not a lot there to be seen, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess uh, Herod didn't have future archaeologists in mind when he did that, did he? Exactly. S sometimes uh, we get lucky, as it were, uh, when that, and sometimes we don't when it comes to these things. Okay, so now you mentioned that Jehu uh, demolished the Temple of Baal um, in his initial attempts to sort of eradicate idolatry. Uh, any, any evidence connected to uh, this particular temple, Brian? Well, um, the short answer is no, but let me give a, maybe a, a fuller example, a fuller answer. Um, if we go back, we see that Baal worship was rampant throughout the land at that particular time. And we're told that uh, Ahab was the one who set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. That's 1 Kings 16.32. And then um, we're told um, that 
Jehu demolished the temp, the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal, and he made it a latrine. Uh, and the, the writer says it made it a latrine to this day. Now, there is no evidence that has been unearthed of the uh, temple of Baal, uh, of the, this cultic complex that was there. Um, but the Acropolis hasn't been fully explored. And so there is some tantalizing opportunity there uh, because um, the whole eastern side of the Acropolis wasn't excavated. And so it, it, there's a possibility that that might be where it is. It seems to make sense because temples in the ancient world were usually on the Acropolis at the high part of the city. So it makes sense that it might be there, uh, but it hasn't been excavated to this point. Uh, I should mention, though, that last little phrase where he talks about it being made a latrine to this day. We actually do have archaeological evidence of that sort of desecration, that often um, when they were desecrating a shrine, they would set up a toilet there. And so um, something was discovered uh, like this at Lahish in 2016. There was a gate shrine, uh, and the, the altar there had all the horns broken off, and, and a toilet, an Iron Age toilet, um, uh, this stone square with a hole in it was discovered there. Now that dates to the time of Hezekiah's reforms, but it seems that um, Jehu did something very similar at Samaria where he made it a latrine to intentionally desecrate that site. And so he talks about his zeal for the Lord. So it seems that Jehu started well, um, but it doesn't seem that he ended well. Yeah, and that often can be the case, you know, uh, f finishing the race strong, as it were, if you want to use a spiritual analogy, you know, that applies to the Christian life and sometimes applies to these, to these ancient kings. Um, you know, it's interesting too, Brian, because sometimes, you know, uh, I don't know if we have critics sniping about this uh, particular temple, but maybe you could comment a little bit up, up on, on the, the principle of uh, lack of uh, excuse me, absence of evidence, since that stuff hasn't been excavated. Maybe a new audience member, someone who hasn't been watching before, this is their first time, explain a little bit about that uh, principle. Sure. One of the things we have to be careful of um, anytime, but particularly in the field of biblical archaeology, when we're reading or seeing the claims that people make, is to um, watch for logical fallacies. And there's a logical fallacy called the uh, absence of evidence. And it goes like this. If there's no evidence, then um, it didn't exist or it didn't happen. Um, and I think we would be well served to follow, I think it was Kenneth Kenneth Kitchen's maxim that the absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. There's just been too many times in biblical archaeology where someone said, oh, there's no evidence for that person. There's no evidence for Belshazzar, um, uh, the king of Babylon. And then all right. of a sudden we find an inscription that has it. There's no evidence for King David. And then we have the Tel Dan inscription that mentions the house of David. And so we just need to be aware of that. And especially when large parts of the whole um, ancient Near East, and in particular Samaria, haven't been excavated yet. Yeah, very good principle for us to follow, even if you're not an experienced archaeologist. Uh, people in the church should pay close attention to that fallacy. Well, friends, we're here with uh, Brian Wendell, uh, my friend, and uh, ABR staff member. We're talking about King Jehu, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Jehu. All right, Brian, let's, uh, let's jump right into inscriptions that mention his name. Uh, let's go for it. All right, well, Jehu's reign corresponds to that of Shalmaneser III, the Assyrian king. And that's fortunate for us because the Assyrians left us lots of inscriptions, and there was interaction at this time between uh, the Assyrians in the east and Israel in the west. And you're right, Jehu is named in a number of uh, Assyrian inscriptions. One of the longest is um, uh, one of the longest versions of Shalmaneser's annals 
was discovered on a large stone tablet in the wall of the city of Asher, and it records various campaigns that he took through the first 21 years of his reign. And he mentions that in the 18th year of his reign, he crossed the Euphrates. Shalmaneser III says he defeated Hazael, the king of Damascus. And in addition to the victory, he wrote, I received tribute from Bali Manzeri of Tyre and from Jehu of the house of Omri. Another, um, this same inscription has been found in other places, other copies of his annals. They were found on uh, two monumental bulls that were discovered at uh, Nimrod, ancient Kala, uh, in an annalistic tablet, as well as on the Kerbail statue of Shalmaneser III. This statue was discovered at Fort Shalmaneser. It appears to have been dedicated to the god Adad and on it, there is an inscription, again, mentioning Jehu's tribute. All right, so uh, not only the mention of the name, but, but uh, some of these inscriptions uh, you wanted to talk about a little bit about how they help us understand his reign a little bit more. Please, please comment on that, Brian. Yeah, one of the things that archaeology is very helpful for, and one of the things that I love about it, is it, it fills in the gaps. It, it provides the historical context for some of these things that happen in Scripture, and in particular with Jehu and Shalmaneser and Hazael, king of, uh, of Damascus, the Aramean king, um, it helps us to understand the geopolitics of the day. And so um, let's just, let's work our way through this uh, briefly. Um, these Assyrian inscriptions mention that it was in the, 20, the 18th year of Shalmaneser that um, Jehu made these tributes. Now, that happens to correspond to 841 BC, which is the year that Jehu became king. And so it appears that, if we believe the Assyrian sources, and I see no reason not to, that um, Jehu paid tribute to Shalmaneser III in his very first year. And so um, what we can understand from this is it helps us understand a little bit of the world at that time. So if we go back in time about a decade earlier, uh, there was a big battle called the Battle of Kakar, and Hadadezer, the Aramean king of Damascus, assembled this coalition of forces to go against the Assyrians, and one of his allies was Ahab, king of Israel. So at that point, um, the Arameans and the Israelites are allies, and being a chariot commander who had served for some time, Jehu likely fought in that battle under King Ahab. But sometime after this, the Arameans and the Israelites became enemies because Israel um, allied itself with the king of Judah and um, eventually, we know, with the Assyrians. And so uh, Shalmaneser's annals record that in 841 he came and he fought against Hazael and the Arameans. He says, Hazael of Damascus put his trust upon his numerous army and called his troops in great number, and I fought with him and I inflicted defeat upon him. And he talks about... Um, uh, besieging him in Damascus. And then he writes, again, I received tribute from Bali Manzeri of Tile and Jehu of the House of Omri. You see, Jehu had recently claimed the throne um, through his support with um, Shalmaneser III, paid tribute to him, and essentially became a vassal of the Assyrians. And this helps us to understand a comment in Scripture, because the Bible talks about this enmity between Hazael and Jehu, we read in 2 Kings 10, but Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which made he made Israel to sin. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Hazael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel. And so the Assyrian records help us understand why there was this enmity between, um, between Jehu and Hazael, and it helps us to make sense of this one little verse that just kind of gets stuck in Scripture. We get to see the bigger picture when we see these Assyrian inscriptions, and particularly as they relate to Jehu. Yeah, you know, a number of things that really strike me about, about these kind of things, and then I'll let you comment on it. One is the, the, the internal dating of the Bible itself. You know, our, our friend Roger Young has extensively published work on that. We'll put something up on the screen for folks who want to dig deep if they like chronology. But the point of all that is, is simply the fact that it requires eyewitness testimony um, to get all of those dates right and how they synchronize with these external empires. So that's one thing, if you could comment on that. And then just sort of 
uh, having to place the, uh, the people there, just the, just the eyewitness nature of it. There's just no getting around uh, the fact that the author is placed in this historical context. You've got about a minute or so for that, Brian. Yeah, and one of the things that we often talk about is the historicity of Scripture. And um, people might say, well, you know, how can these stories that have been told, and, and some people suggest that the, the Bible was not written at the time it was written, that it was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later in the Persian period or even later than that. Um, you have to stop and ask yourself, how did they get so many details right? Because the um, the confirmation, the 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 uh, correlation is with Assyrian records. And so we have these accounts that are in Scripture, which are affirmed by Assyrian records. They had to have come. I mean, what's Occam's razor, right? The, the simplest explanation yes. is usually the correct one, right? Yeah. What, what's the simplest explanation? Well, that these were written at the time they purport to be, um, and that they are affirmed by the inscriptions from Assyria because they're true and accurate. Yeah, and you know, you know, sometimes we can have oral traditions that are passed down. There is some legitimacy to that, but but you can only go so far with that. These texts are so precise in, during this div divided kingdom period. I mean, the the dates and the overlaps of the reigns, and even even sometimes to the very month, you have these these kind of things written in the biblical text. And it's remarkable too, Brian. Let my last comment, and then we'll go to break. Is the Assyrians pretty did a pretty darn good job because the Bible shows that the, their chronology was pretty accurate. Yes, indeed. Well, friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth. We're glad you're here. Uh, I'm talking with Brian Wendell about King Jehu, and we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm your host. I'm here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Jehu. Okay, Brian, uh, in our last segment here, we got two power hitters here of evidence. The first one, one of my favorites to say, is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser. Please share about that. Yeah, we save the best for last here. This is one of the most famous um, monuments, most famous inscriptions. Um, it is a black alabaster monument that was discovered in a building at Nimrod by Sir Austin Henry Laird in 1846. And it records Shalmaneser III's military conquests through the first 31 years of his reign. And um, there's different panels and different inscriptions and different um, illustrations. And one of them uh, has this inscription. It says, tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden beaker, golden goblets, pitchers of gold, lead, staves for the hand of the king, javelins I received from him. And this particular inscription, what makes it so amazing is that there is an image of someone bowing before Shalmaneser III. And many scholars believe that this is an image of Jehu himself prostrating himself before the king of Assyria, which um, vassal kings had to do. And um, Dr. Bryant Wood gives a good explanation of this. He says, the black obelisk represents the only possible likeness we know of, of a king of Israel or Judah. Of the four, all of the 14 Israelites are bearded, they have long hair, they wear a pointy cap. In addition, they're wearing this mantle or cloak over a tunic that, um, that has these uh, frills at the bottom. All, of course, except the figure who is prostrate before Shalmaneser III. And so um, Dr. Wood says, as part of his humiliation, it appears that he had to remove his outer garment, Jehu did, thus forcing him to bow before the emperor of the world in what amounts to his underwear. And so there is Jehu in his undergarments bowing yes. before the king of um, 
the king of Assyria. It should also be noted that in Assyrian inscriptions, Jehu is associated with the house of Omri, sometimes called the son of Omri. He was not related to Omri at all, but because he was the success, successor to the Omri dynasty, um, who and Omri was arguably the greatest king Israel had of the northern kingdom, um, then he was associated with him, even though he wasn't related to him. Yeah, you know, uh, many things to say about that. I mean, the, these these uh, inscriptions are basically photographs, the, the ancient version of a photograph, and there were scribes who sat in the king's court and recorded these things. So it's really the closest thing you can get to that. The second part is, I think, a spiritual principle here, Brian, and that is, you know, uh, as in, in the church age, we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we have to lie prostrate before God's enemies. You know, uh, that's the sad story there with, with uh, Jehu. Um, but uh, I'd like to talk more about that, but, but we need to turn to an even greater discovery, Brian, and that is one of our favorites. We've talked about it numerous times, but it bears repeating, as it were, and that is the Tel Dan Stila. Yeah, the Tel Dan Stila, most, uh, many of our viewers will probably be familiar with it within the context of King David, because it, it makes a, a reference to a king of the house of David. And so it's hugely important for demonstrating David's historicity. Um, and so not to take away from that, it appears to be referencing, though, a historical situation at the time of Jehu. Because if you reconstruct the um, inscription, we believe that this inscription was likely written by Haziel, the king of Damascus. And in it, he claims to have killed uh, a king of Israel, which is reconstructed to be Joram, the king of Israel, and Ahaziah, the king of Judah of the house of David. Now, um, those of our viewers who are astute will note that there seems to be a discrepancy now between the Tel Dan Stela that says where Haziel claims that he killed Joram and Ahaziah, and the Bible, in which claims that Jehu killed um, Joram and Ahaziah. So how do we uh, reconcile that? Well, it's hardly surprising that an ancient king like Haziel would take claim for something that he didn't do. That happened regularly in the ancient world. The propaganda machines went into overdrive yeah. for these particular kings. But it, Todd Bolin has pointed out that the word meaning to kill can also mean defeat or to strike. Um, and so, and if you read the biblical text carefully, what you will find is that uh, Joram was wounded by Haziel, the king of Aram. And that's why he was at Jezreel to begin with, recovering when Jehu came and killed him there. So um, it's not surprising. And Haziel might even have some justification for taking credit because. Um, Joram never recovered from his battle wounds. Um, in either way, there are ways to explain um, these particular discrepancies that appear there. And once we start digging in, there's, there are logical explanations for them. But the Tel Dan steel is very important because it's referencing yes. the exact situation at the time of Jehu that Scripture describes. Much of what you said there is self-explanatory. Just one principle I'll add is sometimes archaeology uh, when it seems to be a conflict with Scripture, can prod us to go back to the text to make sure that we've interpreted carefully enough. Sometimes we think it says something in it. It could have nuance in the vocabulary or language, and then it kind of it helps us in that way. It doesn't change Scripture, but it forces us to look more closely at it. Sometimes we assume certain things that we ought not. Okay, now Brian, here we are, down to the end of another show. you got about a minute and a half, my friend to give it a, a summary for us, if you would, please. Sure. Well, um, with the life of Jehu, I think, um, first of all, we see the historical elements of his life. We see this when we look at Scripture, and then we bring into and beside it these Assyrian uh, sources. We see how they not, not only confirm, but they illuminate Scripture. They tell us some of the background to the geopolitics of what was happening at that particular time. And so um, this says a couple of things to me. First of all, uh, obviously, we've said this numerous times on Digging for Truth, the Bible is historically reliable. You can trust it uh, as a document. So I think that's very helpful in terms of confirming and affirming Scripture. It's helpful because it, it helps us to understand things. But I think maybe where I end is I look at the life of Jehu as a good warning for us. Um, 
scripture says that the things that were written about people of old were written to instruct us. Yes. And so when I look at the life of Jehu, I look at someone who started out well. He started in obedience to the Lord. He st- carried out the Lord's um, word and his work, but scripture says he wasn't careful to walk in the ways of the Lord. And I think that that's the warning that I take when I look at the life of Jehu. I think it's a good warning for all of us to finish well and to continue to walk in the steps of the Lord all the days of our life. That's a great application. Brian, thanks again for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Henry. It's always a joy. Friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth. Let's take that lesson of Jehu, and make sure that we remain faithful to Christ and ask him to keep us close to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us today.